So welcome to the Digital Economist from the World Economic Forum here in Davos, Switzerland. We are holding our inaugural round table and we're very excited to have a huge turnover and a highly curated round table. Digital Economist is an impact platform focused on thought leadership and bringing investable opportunities in alignment with the Sustainable Development Goals to the fore. So we're very excited to welcome uh, folks on January 23rd this evening and uh, looking forward to a great partnership and a lot of value we create for the community along the way. So welcome. Welcome everyone, um, uh, and I'm Nabrup Sadev, and I'm the founder and CEO of uh, an impact platform called The Digital Economist. Uh, we launched at the World Economic Forum last year, uh, along with 300 CXOs and uh, council members in attendance, and we're very excited to have uh, Joe Atkinson uh, joining us today from PwC, and who has a huge responsibility of uh, uh, which will will uncover a little bit of uh, driving the future PwC to the to the next level. So, Joe, thank you so much, and welcome again. Thanks, Navroop. I'm excited to be here too. So, uh, thanks for having me. Thank you. And we have, uh, of course, this is a live webinar, so uh, amazing folks in attendance. Uh, total peer group, of course, and many, in fact, senior to us. So, I would just encourage everyone uh, to engage as much as possible and uh, write your questions in the chat function. We want to platform this as a podcast down the line as well. Um, and your questions would be there forever. So ask away um, in, in, in the chat uh, anything you might be interested in. This is a 60 minute webinar. And basically we'll kind of uncover a little bit of Joe's story and what um, inspired your trajectory in terms of your career and I think uh, you know, we talk about corporate governance and all those really big, difficult, you know, crisis related, the net future of world and the global economy related things. And I think it's a huge responsibility, right? And, and you know, we want to uncover a little bit of that. And again, with a lot of senior people in attendance here. Um, and so, Joe, you know, really curious to uncover. I think the level I want to get to is your values level, Joe. So I'm okay. going to say that out there. <laughs> Got it. So tell us a little bit about your yourself, uh, where you're from, um, how you got started, and we'll jump right in after that. Perfect. So um, so I live in and around the Philadelphia area, a town outside of Philadelphia called Haddonfield, New Jersey. Um, I was born in Philadelphia. Uh, families all around Philadelphia. Philadelphia is one of those towns you uh, you stay close to. Um, so I've, I've been fortunate enough over my career, I've had the ability to do that. Um, I started uh, my career at PwC in 1993. Is it okay if I date myself in a group? It's too late now. I've now dated myself. <laughs> so, um, but I started my career in 93. So I'm, I will be 28 years uh, coming up this year, which is kind of amazing, uh, particularly given that my plan was to stay for two or three. Uh, we can come back to that if you want to dig into that one. Um, and, and one of the great things that has, uh, kept me here, obviously people say this all the time. It always sounds kind of, kind of light, but, but the people at PwC are really what kept me here. I keep getting challenged. I keep getting new and, and interesting challenges, responsibilities. And, uh, most recently I became our vice chair for products and technology, and that's the role I have today. Uh, so that's a quick, quick overview. And you can dig into any, any part of that, that you like number yeah, so many, so many interesting stories there, I'm sure. You know, I see one of the things when um, it's a, it's a long term corporate executive, uh, it always seems to me that this story basically is told in the container of the corporate. So that's a very political statement to say. But <laughs> I think, um, yeah, I mean, this happens all the time. And every like sitting down with folks at Beth in particular, I'm like, man, that's a real like, you know, there's a pattern there. So, yeah. you know, let's start there. Why okay. is that the case? <laughs> well, it's funny. Um, I've, 
I've never had anybody describe it that way, but that is so, so true, right? It is, it is, this will sound terrible, but, but, but in some ways really good. It is really hard for me to separate the course of my life from PWC because it's been such a big part of my life and friends and, and family. And, um, it, it's all, it's all interconnected. I think, um, so I said, so I said, I would share the story. I'll share the story. When I started out, I had spent about a year working for Marriott Hotels. It was in the internal audit department of Marriott Hotels, a phenomenal company. They were very good to us for family reasons. I, I said, everybody stays near Philadelphia. We had moved out to California. We need to get back to Philadelphia for family reasons. Uh, my wife had her dad's business to run. And so we were facing this kind of unexpected transition early on in my career. And um, I joined at that time, what was then Coopers and Libram. And I remember very distinctly having this conversation with my wife. Uh, and, you know, as you're making unexpected moves, you can imagine I'm sitting in my childhood bedroom with my wife because I'm staying with my parents at the time. And it's just a very surreal memory uh, surrounded by 80s posters and things. And um, I remember saying to her, look, these, these um, firms, these are great places to start your career. But most people start their career and then find something else or they use that experience to launch their career. And that's probably what will happen. I'll be there two or three years. And then I'll go out and start a different career path. And that was how we started with the firm. And uh, what, was, what was so much fun about the firm, and look, every day is not perfect in anybody's career, but what was fun about the firm was um, the, the years would go and the clients would change and the issues would change and the responsibilities would change and the teams would change. And um, we kept learning things. Like I kept getting new skills. I kept getting new opportunities. I, some skills went away because I didn't do that work anymore. And um, that, that just became this pathway that suddenly two years turned into three, turned into five, turned into 10. And then I made partner in the firm and um, I guess it was around 2001 was my first partner year. And that was, um, that was such a career milestone. And, and for, for, for those that have worked in the partnership firms, such an important part of our identity as a culture of, of partner owners that, that that brand becomes part of your personality in so many ways. And uh, so then a partner career started, which is kind of a different stage of my career. And that, that brought different leadership roles and different parts of the practice. And I learned the telecom and the media space. I started to work with our technology clients, which is where I learned a lot about innovation and development. And one of the great things about a firm like ours, a professional services firm, and there's a lot of great professional services firms out there, is, is your clients become your laboratories. And, and when you have great client relationships, they invest as much in your development as you try to invest in theirs. And that was uh, one of the other things that has kept me around for as long as I've been here. Very interesting. I, I think, uh, I feel like Joe, I have a lot to say to that. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, and just because I think um, a bit of a, obviously you talked about, you know, 28, almost 30 years in PwC. So I'm not for, ready to I round guess... up to 30 yet. No, <laughs> just 28, we're, hold, we're 20, Sorry, 28 holding. Sorry, I apologize. <laughs> 30 sounds like a long time. So 28. Right. Well, you know, 20, 20 23, it will be. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're going anywhere. So, you know, I before we know, we'll have you no. back and, you know, we'll talk about 30 years. So, <laughs> okay, I'll round up. After 30 years with the firm, um, it, it's clear that the expectations of the firm in the beginning of my career are very different than the expectations now. And I think the um, disruption we're seeing from a technology perspective, the societal expectations, are um, changing. And I think most of us always have a debate, I'm sure, but most of us see these expectations as better expectations of businesses than what, what had been there for a long time. So the challenge for a business leader and the challenge that the C-suite of that company has and every other company has is, are, are you driving enough of the change to not just react to what's happening, but to really embrace, I'll use your words, the values behind what's happening and why. And if you're only doing it to react because you need a PR discussion, my, my personal opinion is the companies that try to bridge that with, with PR, the, the, the collective will sniff that out in a heartbeat. If you're actually committed, that your actions are going to trace your words, if you're going to make a mistake, that you're going to own up to it, if you, are, uh, if you exercise a judgment and it turns out to be the wrong judgment, that you own the judgment and you learn from the judgment, then I think organizations are gonna to continue to thrive. And I think that's the, that's the call to action that was in that Economist article is will, will they, and organizations like, like us in professional services, will they, will they rise to the occasion? Right, and, and I think 
very interested to kind of deep dive into that show in a second, but I want to pick up another thread um, that you just kind of mentioned, um, which is, you know, in general, of course, uh, uh, a long haul in, in, in a professional services firm. And we've been talking about, and I mentioned when we were, we first connected, how Clubhouse is all the rage. And I think one of the conversations that I hear uh, and with the global crisis that we see around, and then we'll tie it back, I guess, to the, the big corporate problem and solution. Um, I want to be optimistic there. Uh, is, you know, the, the next decade is really a, a decade of the creatives, uh, a, a decade for entrepreneurship. You know, the world is in such a flux. So, you know, what is then the, 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 the relevance that you talked about? Well, what is it that changes, right? Now, so what, what, does that mean, so and this may be a slightly hard question, yeah. but does that mean now the narrative is more anchored around purpose, values um, compared to what used to be in the past, which is let's say the bottom line, I guess not too long ago, I had my little uh, little you know period of time in, in corporate America and my God. <laughs> and what? it was it was interesting. Yeah, it was it was definitely interesting. This is something I, I don't quite talk about, but um, you know, it seems like a lot of just internal relationship management is you know, a majority of the kind of, uh, you know, time, particularly at the more junior level. And I guess I'll have to hear what, what changes at the partner level, something you uh, kind of mentioned. Um, and, you know, really sort of what's the, how do you see, you know, a professional services firm and perhaps PwC in particular in this changing world, in this changes, changing context? So um, that is a really hard question. Never, and so, um, let me let me hopefully do it justice, but but having gotten to know you a bit, I'm sure if I don't, you'll come back at me, which you should. So we keep the conversation where it where it needs to be. So I'd say a couple things. One is I think entrepreneurialism, that innovation idea of how do we unlock people's creativity and really not only unlock their creativity, but give them room to use and apply that creativity, I actually think is one of the most powerful things to happen in business in decades. And um, we'll come back to the way PwC is thinking about that in a second. But, but if, if I look back, and again, I, at, at nearly 30 years, I obviously have a, have a um, very, very strong affinity and, and love of PwC. There's not a, another word probably to apply to it. One of the things that I do love about PwC is our partnership model is an entrepreneurial model. This is the tension point, right? So, so great partners are business innovators and thinkers. They start to unlock ideas. And in fact, for most people, when you start in a firm like ours, the way to become a partner is to unlock new ideas. And it may not, we may not always associate creativity with professional services providers and accountants and financial advisors and taxation providers, et cetera. But the reality is the creativity of how do I create new value that, that is the key to growth in an organization like ours. So now I'll come all the way back to the beginning of your question. Well, if, if creativity and innovation, if that license to innovate, that license to create, that, that entrepreneurial spirit is really what you're after, how do you make sure the large organizations like ours don't kill it? Like, how do you make sure they don't, um, at one point you'd, you'd say, if you have too much of it, you, you can't kind of take advantage of the scale that you have. And that's a challenge we think about a lot. On the other hand, if you don't actually provide for it, then your best creative, innovative thinkers are going to go find a place where their creativity and innovation can, can, can bloom. So we're trying to constantly strike that balance of we've got to have it directed and open to the businesses that we're in, but we want to, we want to unleash it. And we have called that citizen-led innovation. And mm -hmm. that's been a big part of our upskilling process um, is how do we equip people with not just the technology tools and, and technical skills, really important, but how do you equip them with product mindset? How do you equip them with, you know, we all talk about agile methodology and everybody wants agile to solve everything. But the reality is that having people that think more broadly about how to solve a problem is really important in what we do. And if you have that creativity, I, my job and part of our leadership team's job is to make sure that you can be successful here by applying it. Right, interesting. And so what does that translate into from a culture perspective? You know, corporate culture comes up again and again. And I think, again, we'll tie that back into governance very, uh, very quickly, uh, we can. Um, but, you know, what would you say, you know, uh, you talked about agile and I mean, kind of the circles that I'm part of, even that's outdated. Um, 
this is not to say this is not useful. Of course, we all yeah. want to be agile just from a fundamental perspective. But I think um, design, particularly human-centered design, has been, um, you know, a, quite interesting. In fact, you know, that's sort of what inspired the the, the birth of digital economies to how do you take you know, uh, economic science, which is complex and it's just like weird, nobody quite understands it. Only the economists speak the language, nobody understands them. They don't care about the rest of the world. How yeah. do you combine that with, you know, human-centered design uh, and, and actually unlock that entire uh, world of, you know, everything from the mindset to, uh, to products and services and knowledge, right? Um, yeah. So kind of having said that, you know, I'm, I'm personally very bullish about it. But I think there's a lot that translates into when you want to create that um, ecosystem and culture of innovation. So I'm really curious to hear, and I think maybe, Joe, we can go into a little bit, um, you know, how your current role, you know, became what, uh, over, over, the, over the years from the chief digitalization officer. Uh, yeah, talk, talk to us a little bit about that story. Yeah, let me, um, so, I, so if you don't mind, I want to come back to your human-centered design point, because I completely, completely agree with you. Um, that um, methodologies, whether it's agile or what have you, um, that they're, they're all tools in the toolbox for the moment, right? And any one of them, if we're all doing our jobs, should be improving over time, we should be challenging them. Um, it is funny when you have people debating the merits of old methodologies. I still have plenty of people in the environment that will tell me why uh, waterfall methodologies actually are undervalued and you should be thinking about some of them from particularly enterprise scale technologies because you have all kinds of concerns on security and infrastructure and, and adoption and some of the elements of some of our older methodologies actually handled those issues in some ways better than our newer methodologies. But your point on human centered design to me is the bridge like that's the piece that brings it together. Uh, we looked at we looked at our evolution from a from an upskilling perspective we started uh, I, I often use this, this um, kind of silly analogy of farming. So we started with this idea, if you're going to farm, you got to plow the field. The field's got to be ready for what you're going to plant. And that for us was acumen. We talked about digital acumen. And we rooted our digital acumen in concepts that were built on human-centered design. Who, who are you building for? What are you doing? What's the, what's the solution for? And that was the way that we started the acumen discussions. And then we trained people in the tools that they needed for the work that we do in the firm. Uh, data tools and cleansing tools and analysis and visualization tools and bot building. And then as that evolved and we kept big, digging, if you will, deeper into those technical skills, the next thing that we launched, we only launched two things firm-wide that we required everybody to do. The first one was a digital acumen kind of orient, I call it an orientation. We did a digital badge that some people probably saw us pushing out. But when we came back around, the next one we did was human-centered design. Because the belief was that if you don't have an understanding of the human-centered design principles in order to continue that adaptation as people change and technologies change and methodologies change and everything else changes, if you can't root it back to what's the problem I'm solving and who am I solving it for, then, then you're going to go astray or you run the risk that you're going to go astray. So I just, I didn't want to miss that point in the group on, on the importance of your, your human-centered design because uh, we are equally uh, bullish on the importance of human-centered design. And, and I'll, I'll make one last comment and then I'll come back to the question that you asked me that I may have forgotten after I've rambled for a bit. The, the other comment I will make is imagine that you are a tax accountant and, and Joe Atkinson or Tim Ryan or somebody else in the leadership of the firm says, I need you to study human-centered design and I want you to invest some time in human-centered design principles. And in fact, uh, we're gonna ask you to apply that knowledge and show that you have that knowledge in order to earn a digital badge in human-centered design. You can imagine the number of questions we got. Why am I doing this? I don't do design. I'm not a creative type. And then what happened is people dug in, they did it, and they said, oh my gosh, I had no idea how often I'm actually applying or have an opportunity to apply those principles and, and what that can do to the way I do work day to day. So I just think it's a very universal uh, kind of capability and thought process acumen, pick, pick your language, but I think it's a really universal one. Right, right. So that's interesting there, um, Joe. I think definitely uh, there is more than one ways to kind of, you know, look at it and um, kind of hold, I guess, larger corporates accountable. Um, so that is actually a great kind of segue into, you know, the, 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 the topic that, uh, you know, fires all of us up uh, with a world and what we call the quadruple crisis. Um, which is the environment, uh, the health, the social, and the economic, right? What do you see as the role 
of uh, corporate governance in the next decade? Look, it's, um, and I think it was Edelman that came out with a study that said in the current environment, businesses actually accrue more trust than some governments, than government among most people. And I'm, I'm going by the, I'm going by my top line memory, but that, that um, in that environment where the institutions that have often engendered trust are in question, then, then we as business leaders have got to answer the question, well, what are, what are we going to do about it? And I think it goes to your earlier comment about, are we a bottom line profit at all costs organization or are we something different than that? And we, we strive to be something very different than that. So we, we say often we're purpose led and values driven. And if you think back to this discussion about what are the, what are the objectives of an organization, um, the, the business roundtable in the US and many of your viewer, your, your participants and viewers in your community would probably know, business roundtable of which our chairman's a part, um, looked at that question and said, what, are, what is the purpose of business? And they shifted that pretty dramatically and not as many people as you would hope would, would notice noticed, but they shifted it dramatically um, as frankly, I think was well overdue to shift. And that is that um, the traditional view that businesses are in the business of accruing value only to shareholders has, has to be challenged. The role that businesses have in communities, the role that we have as either contributors to or takers from the environment uh, that that's a responsibility. And, and most of us in our personal lives feel a sense of responsibility for our neighbors. We feel a sense of responsibility for how we care for the things that we have responsibility for, whether it's a home or apartment or a space, whether it's a, a family member, whether it's a neighbor, whatever it is, most of us feel a sense of responsibility. That sense of responsibility absolutely should, I believe, translate to executives who are, who are um, shepherding these organizations. And, and, I will, I will say, which won't surprise you, given the way I've commented about the firm so far, as, as a leader in a firm that has a 170 year history, I feel a huge sense of responsibility to that legacy to make sure that we maintain our relevance and our value and our connectivity to what's important. So that's a big lead up to, well, how are we thinking about environmental, for example? We've made a net zero commitment by 2030. Uh, if you look at the if you look at the firm, uh, probably won't surprise you. Much of our carbon footprint would be associated with the travel of our people, uh, be associated with the footprint of our offices. So we're looking at how do we get very creative about the way we deliver, and it's one of these strange uh, situations where the pain of the pandemic and the and the and the power powerful problems that we've all been coming through actually has unlocked some innovation and thinking about how we can get there. Um, it's, it's broken down some very, very significant uh, biases and barriers that frankly our firm had and our clients had about what work looks like and what does valuable work look like and where do you have to be and I've got to observe everybody and they got to be in the conference room to realizing that no, there's a lot of ways to do things without, without the burden of carbon producing travel, for example. So that's, that's one example. The next example would be um, what I'll say broadly on governance. The, the, the determination of what voice we want to have as an organization um, in government matters, in de determinations about um, trust in, in government institutions, that's, that's a challenge uh, because people are so polarized right now that you have to recognize that, that at some places people want to hear your opinion on these things and in some places they do not. And in our environment, we've got to really think about what are the places where our voice is helpful to the discussion where it's where it's contributing in a in a in an important way. And in that perspective, I would come back to the work that our chairman has done on CEO action. We recognize there's a diversity and inclusion problem. We recognize there's a racism problem. We recognize that there's a community problem in the way organizations are responding to racism. We recognize today that there is a, a problem with racism with Asian Americans that is out of hand. And either you're going to be silent on these topics or you're going to speak up and say, this isn't who we are. This isn't who I am. This isn't who our firm is. And not only are we gonna speak up on the topic, but we're gonna take action. And that's why I think CEO action is a great example. Tim has, uh, through, through a really, really big and significant effort, assembled over a thousand CEOs to commit to specific actions to try to make the workplace better. Is it perfect? Of course not. Is it done? No way. But that to me is the, the burden of leadership in an organization like ours. You have to act. 
you know, um, I was just wondering, I guess, a more nuanced version of, of, of that when it comes to the, the governance question. Because yeah. here's the thing. Well, I mean, that polarization is not a coincidence, right? It's, yeah. uh, it's an outcome of a, a trajectory that has been unfolding over the past 50 years, you know, a, a rough ballpark number. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, so to your point on the polarization, I think the reality is that um, our expectations on economics have created some expectations with respect to scale. And so you've seen all these organizations that have tried to scale their businesses and they do it through acquisition or mega growth and all of those things. And to your point, you get scale winners and scale losers, which means that your concentration starts to emerge. I think on, I'm going to use, um, I'll come back to, to the environment as an example and, and where the, where the firm believes our role is to play is, is a question of what, what can we do to influence where our clients trust us, where we can influence the trajectory of our clients. And then also what can we do, um, to help ensure that what our clients are sharing with the market, with their communities, with their stakeholders has integrity to it. Um, so the, the whole social uh, ESG space, the, the environment, social governance space, there's a lot of commitments being made. The question that we should all ask of every organization, including you should ask of us, is how are you doing against those commitments? Are, are you actually delivering on the commitments that you've made? I think there's a little bit of a risk that we, that we um, allow ourselves to polarize the debate. And what I mean by that is, if an organization has developed for the last 30 years because they have uh, built an energy business or they've built an organization that today is in a spot that none of us, I think, on balance would say we want to be in in terms of consumption, in terms of impact, et cetera. I think if we, if we allow the debate to stop there, we miss the opportunity to actually move the needle. And we almost give some organizations an excuse just to accept the status quo. And I don't think any of us want to do that. So you have to engage in the debate. And you have to, I believe you have to accept that means that some people will be further along the path than others. But the real question should be progress. And how are we progressing? And how are we holding people accountable for the progress? And by the way, how are we holding people accountable to be truthful and transparent about the progress that they're making? And obviously, that's a place where we think there's a very important role to play of firms like ours. If you're going to tell me that you're maintaining a net zero carbon footprint, then prove it. Prove it to me. Show me that that's actually happening. If you're going to expect that over time, you're going to have transparent governance in your organization, then prove it. Show it to me. Show that it's happening. If you're going to tell me you're going to get better about inclusion in your senior leadership ranks, then prove it to me and show me. And I'll, I'll come back to that one because we released our inclusion report over the summer. It was not perfect. In fact, it highlighted a lot of places where we're not as far along as we want to be, let alone how far along our communities that we serve and the people that care about us would want us to be. But if we don't start putting the facts out there and actually getting alignment about what is the starting point, what's the progress, how do we measure it, what's the alignment around that, then we're going to struggle to make progress. We'll be, argue, we'll be arguing about how the facts fit together instead of hopefully at some point celebrating together the progress we're making. Right. So, you know, what I'm hearing here, Joe, is uh, uh, definitely intent, and, and but also with uh, recognition that there's a lot of work that needs to be done. I'm assuming perhaps because corporates obviously move slower. Um, there's entire machinery that has to be kind of moved along. And, you know, folks, I guess, who, who have been part of that since uh, a long time. <laughs> I would, yeah, I would yeah. say no more years, just kidding. Um, <laughs> and so, um, so, you know, I think, um, you know, when, you look, when, you, when you're looking at the next decade, um, there is a lot of talk, particularly at the World Economic Forum. By the way, that's another great example of yeah. a great shift of uh, going from, all right, this is an elite group of, you know, economics professors and policymakers and some business leaders to, oh, our mission is improving the state of the world, which is yeah. great. I mean, it's you know, it's a great it, example. It, it, it is a great example. And it's funny because one of our previous, actually our opening uh, speaker for the second season, uh, Clara Bloomberg was talking about how when she was first at the uh, World Economic Forum, she was actually pregnant. And people were staring at her like she was some sort of like in a dinosaur costume. Uh, and that's the most interesting uh, you know, description I've ever heard because all the other ladies were either serving coffee or just on the arm of one of the executives. And I've been lucky because I guess I'm, I'm born late enough 
so when I started going to the, the World Economic Forum, it wasn't as horrible as this, but, you know, um, I think the, the world is changing. And of course, uh, many of us are, are catching up. Uh, of course, the biggest crisis, which is the climate crisis, yeah. um, you know, and, and, and other than initiatives that, you know, we are where we are talking and we gathering people and increasing awareness, what is it that needs to happen on the ground, right? Um, from, from a corporate responsibility perspective. Um, I, think, I think one of the biggest things around what organizations need to do on the ground is, is frankly innovation. I mean, the problems that we have to solve are really complex problems. And I'm, I'm gonna come back to um, fossil fuels as an example. Uh, a massive pivot at the last minute on, on fossil fuels um, or a, a massive pivot on fossil fuels has a whole lot of implications on industry, on jobs, on people's ability to manage their home life and people's ability to heat their homes, all kinds of implications. So we're talking about very complex systematic processes and systematic, systematic challenges that need to be solved. And one of the biggest things that needs to happen on the ground is people have to solve these in much more collaborative ways than historically we have. And you see this in a lot of companies today, a lot of um, uh, cooperation and, and connectivity in different ways than what people had traditionally done. I think that's a really positive thing is recognition that the answers to hard questions may be coming from different places. I think the other piece that that is really important is how do you make sure that you're managing the, I'll say the performance of the business? Because again, there's people's jobs, careers, et cetera, that you want to protect and grow, but you don't want to do that at the cost of the planet. So how do you how do you grow a business? How do you make sure it has the investment capacity to actually conduct the research and development that's going to be necessary to work the core problems? And I think that again comes down to innovation. It comes down to making smart investments. And it comes down to being being transparent and accountable about what you're doing and when and how you're doing it. So I think that's the um, I think that's the really really big big piece of that. So there we go. We got a question. What's been the most rewarding aspect of your career? So um, one of the things that I love is and and I say it uh, again often that that working with really really bright and driven people. Uh, people of, of integrity, that's been by far one of the most exciting and rewarding aspects of my career. And honestly, it's really the reason that I've, that I've stayed with the firm as long as I have, is I've been challenged by good people who um, really have worked hard to make sure that we're thinking the right way and we're fulfilling all the promise of the integrity and the trust that we're talking about. So that's been, that's been really uh, a great aspect of it. And I also want to acknowledge the privilege of my career. Um, I, didn't, I didn't start out uh, the, the son of a senior executive. My father was a salesman. Uh, my mother was fortunate enough that, that, or we were fortunate enough that my mother didn't work outside the home. I had six older brothers and sisters. And so um, we were fortunate that my father was able to provide a great life for us. I, was, I had to put myself through college because with seven kids, that wasn't a possibility. But uh, one, of the, one of the great things that has been rewarding is not only uh, being able to grow your career and provide for your family and hopefully be philanthropically active and those types of things, but the chance to do it for other people. And it's one of the greatest things about professional services is that the that the career is so dynamic and the organizations are so dynamic that there's usually job opportunities, career opportunities that are developing. And so when you can connect people to opportunities that unlock a pathway in their career, whether it's a student starting their career or it's somebody mid-career or even late career that wants to make a shift or a pivot in their career, um, I, I, I love that that aspect of it. So that that would be one of the things that I would say on that point. Uh, so how did PwC navigate the shift to remote work during the pandemic? And what's changed in a re, as a result of how you work? Uh, so another great question. So uh, one of the one of the things that um, really give credit to our to our global CIO James Shira and the team. Um, the the reality of the pandemic was that it it was one of these things that many organizations started to watch evolve, but it but when it hit it hit really fast. And most of us are remembering that this week and last week were really the weeks in the U.S. As the, uh, from a US perspective that we started to shut down offices and we started to shut down access to the community and we started to shut down restaurants. And we really started to see the impact of what life was gonna be like in the pandemic. So it's a strange combination of kind of see it coming with this massive hit of um, it changed literally what felt like overnight. 
Um, and I think the, the piece that, that um, is probably easier to see now, but that the shift was so rapid. Um, we, again, we were fortunate. We had been investing in digital skills for a number of years, not because we anticipated the pandemic, but because we were watching the broader trend lines. And we have, we have a vision, we have had a vision for a number of years that it is part of an employer's responsibility to help people bridge the skills gap that's developing around all of us. So we wanted to provide help on data skills and visualization skills and automation skills and all these things. So when the pandemic hit, our people on balance were more comfortable adopting new technologies and moving to virtual and all of that. So that helped a lot. We really were fortunate. We didn't miss a beat, frankly, in serving clients and staying connected with our people. And so that was, a, I think, a really important part of, of our pivot. And now, you know, as we all look back over a, just about a year, um, what's become evident is there's still a ton of work to do to change work at the work layer. And what I mean by that is we've all gotten comfortable adopting technologies to collaborate differently, but we're now starting to crack, well, maybe I can actually work differently. I can actually do the tasks differently. And I actually think that's really exciting. That's probably the next next level of innovation that will happen in, in uh, large organizations. So I'll go back to the, I'm going to go back to the chat. Uh, so local businesses are the backbone of any country's economy. In addition to helping build the local economy, they're also more committed to the welfare of the local communities. Does PwC plan to ever get into building solutions for small and medium businesses? So that is a great question. And the short answer is where we think we can fit there, the short answer is yes. And in fact, um, we have a business in the US and, the, and around the world, it's called slightly different things, uh, but we call it essentially the uh, private company and small business services. So for organizations that are smaller businesses, there actually are services we offer in that space. But one of the things that's been fun about my current job in the role that I've got is we're looking at where technology can be impactful in delivering those services. And so when we can unlock the technology, um, that's the places where we're basically seeing the issues that clients are facing and we can build technology solutions to, to, to pivot and commit to those. There are a lot of companies that are really, really strong in providing technology backbones and application platforms for small businesses. But if there's a place where PwC's expertise and that capability fit, um, we're going to continue to look at those. And I'll actually, I'll actually offer an example. We've got a uh, platform we call ProEdge, which is a training platform that basically... Uh, it, I'll call it an upskilling platform more accurately. It helps organizations identify the gap in what their people have in terms of skills today and what organizations are asking for in skills in similar jobs. A lot of our large clients are looking at that and we're looking at how we can package that to help smaller companies bridge that gap at a cost-effective point so that perhaps they could apply ProEdge to upskill perhaps a smaller workforce because we believe that the kinds of skills that are in, in demand right now are going to be in demand universally. Um, I've said a few times that there, there used to be lots of distinction of tech jobs and non-tech jobs. And I realize there's really deep technical expertise and technology expertise, but we think everybody's going to need a degree of technology and digital skills to fit that creative world that Navroop was talking about earlier. So RJ, let me go to your question. You said, you're, you said your people adapted very quickly at the start of the pandemic. Were there any big hiccups in, on the business side? And from your perspective, are things stabilized? Great, great question. Um, so I would say uh, there were hiccups, of course. Um, one of the things that, that was challenging for us is we had had really good adoption of virtual meeting software and capability, but not 100% adoption. And so for some people, we still had people that, that were adopting those technologies uh, at scale for the first time. They may have gone every once in a while, but it wasn't their preferred mechanism. So that, that was probably a hiccup. The other one is one that we're dealing with now, and I think a lot of organizations like us are dealing with, which is um, how do you manage, how do you manage um, essentially the death of boundaries between work and home? And in that environment of where we are all at all at home or in a workspace that maybe is, you know, wherever it is that we live and whomever it is we live with, that we're all constantly on call in this virtual environment. And so that's another, I won't say it's a hiccup so much as a learning over the last several months, uh, which is we've, we have to do a better job of helping our people achieve the boundaries in their work and life and respecting protected time so that we all get the recharge we need. We call it be well, work well, but I think it's a really important piece of it. And from a stabilization perspective, I would say yes. Um, the good news is I think most of us are looking at a vaccine curve right now 
particularly in the U.S., that suggests that we should see some reopenings and some returns to normal, some degree of normalcy sometime over the summer. What, what I don't think is stable is what is the new work environment look like? And I actually think it's good that that's not stable because we're being creative about what do we need to do? How much time in the office? What's the right way to give people flexibility in that? And I think that combination, um, I think is um, a really interesting opportunity for us to maybe not just go back to business the way it was, but um, to really just um, to keep going and try to shape the way that this comes together. So uh, hopefully RJ, that's, that's uh, responsive. Uh, but this has been a great conversation. And, and one of the things that's been so terrific about um, the questions that both came through the chat and the questions from Navarup is to me that the conversation has been so heavily focused on what's our shared responsibility as organizations, as business leaders, as people. And the fact that that conversation is taking place is to me a very encouraging and optimistic aspect that is a great place to end on a Friday afternoon for those of you in our time zone. Uh, it's a great place to end on a Friday afternoon. So long as we're all willing to debate the really, really challenging questions of the time, I am confident and my my uh, career and the people I've had the privilege of working with uh, would, would certainly support my optimism that we will work out the problems that we're seeing and unlock some really cool and, and I think beneficial aspects of, of business and community and government for the benefit of society over time. So I'm optimistic about that. And I really, really appreciate uh, all, the, all the great questions and participation. And with that, I uh, wish everybody a great weekend and uh, thanks for attending. Please join us next week uh, for our speaker series. Um, and we have Felipe Parso, who is uh, uh, at the World Economic Forum, and he will be discussing and continuing this conversation next week as well. Thanks again, and we'll be in touch.